do new. So please do eat some food. It's just arrived, so it's over there by the tea and coffee. Feel free to go and grab some. water and wine so feel free to help yourself to laugh throughout and just to make sure you're in the right place uh, this is the event for is the UK banking fit for purpose uh, my name is Fran Voigt and I'm the executive director of positive money and we're co-hosting this event with Triodos Bank um, and I'll introduce them in a moment 
Positive Money was founded in 2010 after the financial crash as a response from civil society that we have a financial sector which isn't really serving the society, the domestic economy and the environment. And we've kind of grown since then uh, to become a more established money and banking reform organisation in the civil society sector. And our mission is to reform money and banking so that it enables a fair, democratic and sustainable economy. And we, we think we're, we're a bit far away from that um, as it stands. But obviously since the crash, uh, we have had, when we are at the Conservative Party conference, unfortunately we couldn't get an MP to join us. They're all, we had quite a bit of interest and a few dropouts, um, but we've got a very uh, well-informed uh, and expert panel for you, who I'll introduce in a moment. <coughs> but as we've seen since, you know, we're, just, we're actually 11 years since the crash, um, and since 2010, We've had successive Conservative chancellors presiding over quite big changes to the UK banking system. We've seen it become easier for customers to switch their current accounts uh, and give consumers more power over their, their data. But 10 years after, we still see in the UK uh, a sector that is heavily dominated by a handful of very large, very powerful shareholder banks. And they've actually overseen quite a ruthless programme of branch closures closures, which have left many communities and, and some of the communities we work with without basic access to banking services. You, we see small businesses finding it hard to get access to the lending they need. Um, so we think we're quite far away from a banking system that really enables a fair, democratic and sustainable economy. So how do we get there? What are the kind of new models for banking that could disrupt the system, challenge some of the big players? Um, we're really pleased to be hosting this, this session with, with Trudos Bank and we've hosted another event at the Labour Party conference last week with them. They are a front runner in their sustainable banking globally um, and it's an independent bank that promotes responsible and transparent banking. And we're really pleased to have James Maccaro who's now a special advisor uh, at the bank and he, he represents Trudos on a core group of banks developing the UN principles for responsible banking. Um, which were launched, was launched last week in New York during Climate Week uh, and had a really successful uh, um, reception, I believe. Uh, we're also joined by Philip Blond, who's my right. He's the director of Res Publica, which founded in 2009. He's an internationally recognised political thinker and social and economic commentator. And prior to entering politics and public policy, taught theology and philosophy at Exeter and coming out. He's the author of Red Tory, which sought to redefine the centre ground of British politics around the ideas of civil association, mutual ownership and shared enterprise. And we're joined by Rebecca, um, who's responsible for UK finances, media and comms programme and government affairs strategy in the UK and internationally. Prior to joining UK finance and the BBA, Rebecca was solicitor and previously in the Conservative Party's international office. And we're obviously aware we probably got a lot more expertise in the audience, so as Positive Money likes to do things as participatory as possible, we'll be asking you to feed in once we've heard from the panel. Um, and we might, I might even be interjecting some questions from Positive Money supporter base, because we are a people-powered organisation. Um, but first of all, we're going to hear from our panellists, and um, Rebecca, if you're happy to kick us off. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, so, ahead of uh, this afternoon, I think I was asked the question to talk on uh, what is the social bank value of, of the banking sector in the UK? Um, and for me, that's a topic that really has to be kind of clearly talked about and defined because we are terrible as an industry about talking about the social value of what we do and actually that there is value in what we do. And I think too often as a sector, we take it for granted that people think having a large banking sector uh, is economically be beneficial, is good for society, and actually there are many, if not most, in the UK that would quite happily see the UK banking sector smaller or relocated or undertaking a different kind of activity. So why do we, we have a right to exist? Why should we be here in the UK? And, and is what we're doing actually good for um, the UK? And so what I wanted to talk about today was uh, two areas really. One was the purpose and value of the industry um, in terms of what we do. And then secondly, what more do we need to continue growing that value and being beneficial? 
And in that second part, this isn't going to be the industry kind of going, we need less regulation, we need to pay a lower taxes. Actually, we think the best thing for the UK is if we have a well and strong, transparent and highly regulated industry that people trust. And in, the, in that trust, that is how we grow what we do here. But what about the banking sector? I mean, is it, is it actually a force for good? Can it ever be a force for good? Firstly, I would say yes, because the banking sector is no longer driven by shareholder value. Um, last month, the Business Roundtable, an organisation of multinational CEOs, came together to say for the first time, actually, shareholder value shouldn't be our primary aim. Instead, companies should focus on the value they deliver for all stakeholders. So how does the finance and banking sector really demonstrate that it acts beyond its own narrow self-interest and that of capital providers? Why should the UK be happy about continuing to have this world-leading sector on our shores? Well, I would say that the UK services sector does deliver for the whole economy. It's an industry which provides SMEs the finance they need to grow. 58 billion was lent to SMEs last year. Eight out of 10 SMEs that come forward and ask for finance get the financing they need from the banking sector. That's 80%. And that is probably about the right figure. If you talk to the business community and to business groups, not every company that comes forward for finance is viable, and nor should we seek to lend to, to businesses that aren't viable. But we need to rebuild the confidence between the banking sector and the SME sector so that the right SMEs and more SMEs come forward. We have a crisis of confidence in that part of the market where some SMEs don't feel they should ever ask for finance. And we need to focus on rebuilding that trust because actually where we do build those relationships between banks and the um, SME customers, actually we can build a very strong and valuable flow of not just finance but mentoring, guidance and support. But we're also an industry that exists to help families and homeowners. Uh, 1.2 trillion in mortgage lending to homeowners last year. The numbers get too big that they almost become meaningless. But if you think about the number of people that means to get a home in terms of ownership and can drive forward that level of wealth in the UK economy, it's absolutely critical that the sector continues to work in that space and continues to do so responsibly. But it's also areas where we don't necessarily think about banking. So the sector last year stopped every two in three pounds of attempted fraud. So we all know that fraud is now the UK's single biggest crime and one of its fastest growing crimes. And actually as an industry, we have a real responsibility and purpose in ensuring that we help protect customers from that um, e economic crime. And if we're stopping two thirds of attempted fraud, then that has to be a key part of what drives us forward and what we do. Um, it's effectively 1.7 billion in terms of economic activity. We're preventing going to criminals to invest in drugs or other sort of activities such as human trafficking. Now, usually the sector sits here and talks about how much tax we pay and how many people we employ. And those are important core parts of our economic value. But it shouldn't be what drives our purpose, and it shouldn't be what drives how we think we should be taking our business activity forward. And often some of the things that we don't talk about is the work going alongside that kind of core economic interest. Um, so thinking about some of the industry initiatives we've been working on and supporting with our member firms over recent years. Um, well, I know that we're all waiting for the domestic abuse bill to go forward and through Parliament, and hopefully uh, with the uh, prorogation ended, we'll now see that activity being taken forward. One of the things we've been working on is the Financial Abuse Code of Conduct, so that firms can improve how they identify those who are at risk of financial abuse and economic control and help them seek access to the right support and to regain control of their money. And we've been working with consumer groups and representatives right across the industry to implement that work and put in place some really important steps to help people in those circumstances. We've also introduced the authorised push payment uh, voluntary code, uh, which is a terribly named initiative, but effectively what it means is if someone is tricked out of their money and they end up transferring it to you, a scammer, rather than a genuine person, we will reimburse that money to the customer, regardless of whether we can track it and trace it through the system. And it sets out the rules by which we will make that reimbursement. That isn't a mandated change required by the regulator or by government. Actually, in many ways, it would be much easier for us to implement if it had been forced on the industry. That was a voluntary initiative that the industry worked with consumer groups and with which and others to take forward and implement. It's been in place for a couple of months now and is being funded by the industry to, to be put in place permanently. But I think it's just one example that the industry understands it didn't always get things right. And I'm never going to sit or stand on, on a platform and say, nothing to see here, the banking sector has always conducted itself in a way that people expect. But I think there is now an acceptance that the values and the cultures behind these institutions does need to change and does need to acknowledge people's concerns about the sector. Um, and these are some of the issues that we've seen being brought forward. 
Um, we also talked about access at the start here, whether that's access to branches or cash or ATM networks. And I think this is a really important debate that the industry has to have because fundamentally we are in many respects a utility service. We provide core access to bank accounts and to money and we need to ensure that we get that right. Um, this morning we launched our Access to Cash initiative as UK Finance, which is an industry um, commitment to help local communities identify the source of cash and access to cash that they need so that we can build the right sustainable framework for local areas to identify um, that important access because one of the challenges we have right now is people are choosing to use less cash. I think the latest data says that every month a typical customer uses their <coughs> uh, debit card 28 times but cash only 11 times and if that cash usage is declining it's hard to ensure that the infrastructure stays sustainable. Now rather than just allow that infrastructure to fall away, we as an industry need to work together to find a way to build the right sustainable platform, which means people can access cash because it's critical that for some people that is the, the only way they choose to manage their money and they need to be able to take that forward. And finally, I just wanted to comment on climate and the UN business principles, um, which were launched last weekend. We at UK Finance signed up last week. Um, it's, uh, we're the, the first industry body in the UK to make that commitment, and we'll be encouraging all of the banks and firms that participate in our organisation to sign up today because I think we do have a real responsibility and ability to drive forward um, an important change when it comes to climate and how we manage that going forward. So I couldn't agree more with the importance of backing that initiative. So for us, for me, that is why I think the sector is valuable. I don't think we're very good at telling the story. I think too often we just focus on the city and allow people to think about the markets and what's going on. And too often we're portrayed as wanting to kind of seek lower regulation. But from our perspective, we would love to see a government agenda that actually enables the smaller banks and the new banks that have been created to build their business models with a more proportionate approach so that they can grow and actually compete against some of the more traditional incumbent firms that exist in the market. And um, with that kind of pause for thought, I will stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rebecca. I covered a lot of ground there. And so I'm going to pass over to James. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm representing Triodos Bank. And um, in terms of the whole thing, in terms of being fit for purpose, Trados Bank, for those who don't know, was a bank which started with, with a very different purpose. So you hear now of banks who set up as startups to become challenger banks, to kind of challenge the market share. We set up as a bank, as a challenger bank, to challenge the paradigm of banking and what it really <coughs> fundamentally was. So it came out of a speaking group discussion of people who were in the financial sector and going, what is the purpose? What is it that we're meant to be doing? So as an, as an institution which effectively is giving credit into the economy. What is it we're wanting to do here? What is it that we want to bring into that economy? And what is fundamentally healthy? It started with that question. We became a bank, started in the Netherlands, came here uh, in 1995. I joined in 1998, so it's been just nearly 22 years with the bank, specifically looking at where are the ideas that could be in the economy which are driving positive impact social, environmental, and cultural change, things that people really value. We were trying to figure out what is it that we need to do as a bank to be able to make that happen. So we got involved in lots of uh, initiatives in renewable energy, in organic farming, social housing, social care. All of our um, projects that we lend money to are on our website. That proposition isn't just because we want to kind of uh, uh, put a regulatory burden on ourselves, it's because it's important for everybody to be able to be conscious and aware of what they're doing so they become more free to act. And that's something which is kind of underlines our principles. When I started 20 years ago, I was the only person you could call in the United Kingdom if you wanted a wind farm loan and you weren't a utility. Uh, because it was seen as, it was definitely ignored, it was in the, it was, it was in the shadows somewhere, it was seen as alternative uh, energy. Uh, everything was alternative that we did. Um, as opposed to ethical or then sustainable and now kind of just the market. Um, and that's been the, the story mirrored in terms of how Triodos Bank has been regarded. I think first we were sidelined after the financial crisis and the fact that we had not just kind of good profile and good customer relations but um, consistent returns, not a level that, that, that others had before the, cr the, the, cr the crash, 
um, but very consistent <coughs> dividend returns from doing real economy business. Um, we were taken notice of, but then still people would say, yeah, but I mean, this isn't really a proper bank or, or, or whatever. And then actually now, the, the markets which we've been in, in terms of uh, environmental and social business, really kind of coming to the, to the forefront of what, what people recognise as what's needed in the future, from the climate crisis, but from also multiple planetary crises on environmental point, a lot of uh, social systems under huge stress and, and, and at crisis points, needing to channel money now into those sectors seen as the only business which banking can be doing which is healthy. We've gone full sort of cycle into a time when there, are, there have been, and there were many of the uh, major UK banks, not all of them yet, but, but many who've signed on to the UN principles for responsible banking, which will drive them to work with stakeholders to say, where do we actually have our biggest impact? What could we be doing there? Um, and what targets should we set to be able to be accountable to those targets? Others have got a long way to go, but it's the first meaningful commitment. So it feels like we've gone through that cycle, as Gandhi said, um, you know, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, then you win. The, uh, the postscript probably is, then they probably claim it was all their idea in the first place. <laughs> We're going through that right now. And, and that's, that's from the market side, but on banking reform, we've had a, we've had a whole wave of regulations post-crash where banking regulators have been trying to get to grips with how do you keep banking safe? A lot of regulations have focused on the specific boundaries and the perimeter of an institution. You've got your savings in an institution. Where do those savings go? And let's just have a look at what's happening within that bank, with the controls and the check points. And there's many risks, many we've ever talked about in terms of fraud, risk pre prevention, all sorts of things which didn't exist probably 20 years ago to the degree they, they do now. But one of the things which is most fundamentally missing right now, which is the kind of the, the, the boundary, is being able to recognise the banking system in a broader context. So as to quote a more left-leaning uh, uh, economist, uh, John Maynard Keynes said, uh, in the long run, we're all dead. Um, but he's still an economist, so the we in that sentence is still we individually, we each are all dead, not we collectively, because economists don't really look that much at the collective. And if you take something like the climate crisis, when I've just come back from, from New York, and the current science is that we might be tripping into a 1.5 degree world within the next three years, and a two degree world within the next seven to eight years. And we have to understand that there is no banking sector. There's no economy in, in some of the things which, which kind of get triggered by those kind of climate scenarios, likewise in different planetary scenarios. So what regulators and governments who give the mandates for regulators need to think about is beyond just the perimeter of a bank and keeping the bank's processes safe individually, what do they need to be doing within the economy collectively? And that's a wider, that's a wider mandate, to, to quote Clayton Christensen, the, the, the strategist, what is the job of work that we're asking our banks to be doing right now. Um, for sure, they are, I mean, they are still on the capital market. I mean, there's, there's something saying, well, maybe we pass through mm -hmm. to just being for shareholder value. I'm not sure it's totally passed through being for shareholder value. I think there's progress despite the fact that the dominant uh, uh, mandate that, that CEOs get is still to, to please capital markets. We've got a very different ownership structure in trials, which helps us uh, to, to set a different course. To manage payments, I'd agree with Rebecca. I think that a lot of what banks do right now is a utility. It may be better managed as a public utility. It should, being able to get cash, actually, why should that be a private enterprise, in fact? Everybody relies upon it. It might be better and easier for banks and easier for the public if that was managed as a utility function. Um, keeping savings safe. I mean, that's in a, in a way what we're wanting to do, but how do you do that as a bank which is lending money? Well, we've had a mandate to sort of uh, save the world, and we've sort of maybe been a bit uh, ridiculed and then sort of engaged with more seriously over the time. Uh, but perhaps the only way of keeping savings safe is by saving, looking to save the planet. So look at the impact that is made as a result of lending through all of those activities and thinking, what does this all add up to? Because 
if it doesn't add up to something which can actually transition us in the economy right now, um, which is needed, I mean, you think about the amount of infrastructure we might need uh, to build in this country in various planetary scenarios. I'll make it more, I'll make it more realistic. We're not that many meters above sea level right now. They've just revised the projections for the Greenland ice sheet from a very low probability of melting by 2040 to a medium to high level of melting by 2040. That's a seven meter sea level rise. If we're bickering now about the things which are kind of going on in, in the country in terms of what we need to do, how are we going to mobilise infrastructure to be built that quickly? How are we going to make sure that pension funds, banks are doing those kind of things? Because unless we transition to that, none of our savings can possibly be safe. Thanks very much. Thanks, James, for putting a lot in perspective there. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a very big conversation happening on um, financial stability risk, so climate change and financial stability risk, and obviously we've been feeding into that, but I guess you have to ask yourself a question. If the city of London or, or downtown in, in New York is underwater, probably your economy at large is going to be quite difficult to get going again. Um, so we've been trying to push the Bank of England on that a little bit. Be great to bring in your thoughts, maybe some political thoughts as well, Philip. Sure, sure. Um, let me start from a slightly different place, which is a description of of, um, uh, of where I, I think we are. And I want to start from what, what other people have mentioned, um, inequality and the inequality that that we now face. So. I remember back in 2010, Harriet Harman did uh, an inequality survey, and roughly speaking, for income, the income between the bottom decile and the top decile, the difference is about 10 times, mitigated by the redistributive uh, effect of, of welfare. They then did uh, an asset inequality uh, between the bottom and the top decile, and that was at 100 times, um, and rising in the very top of the top to 1,000, 10,000 times. Now that was 10 years ago, and it's, it's gone up by several orders of, of magnitude. And what's essentially happened is that, largely speaking, income o over the last decade uh, hasn't, hasn't risen, and in some sense, if you do inequality on income, you could say it's, it's narrowed slightly, because there's been a lot of tax penalties on, on, on high earners, um, as well as those on, on benefits because of austerity, but it's slightly narrowed in terms of income. But if you look in terms of assets, the distribution has only got worse. They've only concentrated even more, and asset prices have widened even more. Why does that matter? Because once asset prices run away from income prices, then for people who are, who are solely on income, they can't access assets, i.e. you don't earn enough to buy a house, um, uh, being the most obvious, and since property is the most widely uh, distributed asset, um, what we are effectively doing is cutting off the young and cutting off uh, workers from owning any assets, particularly in places where people want to live, su such as um, the southeast. And this is compounding and compounding. And um, if you look at our welfare system, our welfare system uh, essentially rewards the old against the young. Most of our pay, most of the rise in public expenditure is to do with the triple lock in pensions and the uh, rise in chronic um, illnesses and expenditure on health. And so, so what we, we've created is, um, is a society that's polarizing and pulling um, further apart. So let's just part that, that's, that's part point one. That's the fundamental restructuring of capitalism that's profoundly dangerous. I, 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 I sort of argued this would happen about 10 years ago, and, and I said we're seeing a return to a Middle Ages form of northern serfdom, except the serfs had it better in, in, in some ways, because um, 
Everyone thinks the Middle Ages was a terrible time, but actually in many ways um, it wasn't. If you were a serf, you could generate a surplus and sell the surplus. And actually a lot of peasants uh, gradually mm -hmm. obtained land and, and property because they were able to generate a surplus. What's remarkable about uh, our condition is it's not possible to generate a surplus through your wages. So you can't gain an asset. So the fundamental ladders of, of a participatory capitalist economy have gone. Now, um, so as I said, put that on one side. Then let's go to UK, let's go to banking. What, what's the fundamental argument that you do in Economics 101 if you start a, a banking? That is efficient allocation of capital. If you look at the capital that's generated, and as you know, banks ha have the sovereign power, they, they can create money. And if you look at it globally, um, what's happened with that power is the enormous amount of credit that banks have generated, um, eye-watering amounts of credit, has largely gone into real estate and largely gone into property. I remember some of the surveys I was doing a few years ago, something like 90% of the money that flowed into Ukraine went into property. Non and property is not an efficient allocation of capital. This is not a productive gain for capital. This is essentially an exclusive asset that bids people uh, out of that asset. Now, why has um, why has uh, why did money flow into property um, rather than other things? Largely because property offered greater returns than other things. Because a rente economy always offers a. Uh, greater returns for, for those who own the asset that's rented out. But what we've got, and people have written books on this, is we've got a growth problem that in the developed world can only be funded by debt. Uh, and we've got a low wage problem whereby the people who are on relatively low wages can't afford anything, so you need debt in order to afford anything. So what's largely happened is that is that economies build up debt in order to finance um, the needs of their populations when growth and the benefits of growth are distributed unequally. So what we're doing, just to kind of produce a rounded picture, and sorry for giving you an account of several moving parts, is, is the banks are progressively generating debt to fund on an equal system where they misallocate capital particularly, uh, though not exclusively, to unproductive assets like property that further <laughs> disenfranchise people that creates more need for debt, that requires the banks to create more debt to funnel it. You get the picture. It's, 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 it's a negative, positive feedback. So, so the more values rise. What's the name for that? Quantitative easing. What's the uh, <coughs> fundamental output quantitative easing? Rising in asset prices. So, so that's where we are. So what I think is interesting is looking at Adair Turner's uh, takes on this, and he wrote about this in, back in 2016, but I think it's equally valid now. And he argues for a removal of, of the money-making power from banks and the restoration of, of the credit function to, of banks to a central bank. Uh, you talked about in your introduction the need to to genuinely um, break the system. And for retail banks to go to what's called 100% reserve banking, so they only lend out the, the deposits they get in. Now, what is the answer to the problem I've described? What is the answer to the problem I've described is productive investment of capital. The capital has to flow to those parts of the economy that generate productivity. Now, largely speaking, this isn't happening at the moment for a variety of reasons. Number one is we, we have no way of telling which companies in which regions are productive. The government has done three innovation surveys and nobody, not even LEPs, responded. And that certainly hasn't figured into bank lending. So we have data out there as to which companies are, and which areas are at national level of innovation, international level of innovation, <coughs> but none of this feeds into lending because we don't have the architecture or the infrastructure. So what I want to end on, and I appreciate you, you want to end, is that I like the idea of taking the 
credit producing function of banks. I like it giving it to a central bank, but I think we need to give this to regional banking structures that are tied in with proper measured levels of innovation that have the granular detail to sort out good from bad businesses and to link those businesses such that they can compete as a whole supply chain rather than singly. So you need a genuine kind of banking structure that can knit companies together precisely for the productivity, innovation and export gain and lend to that at scale. Now what this would deliver is something we don't have in this country, which is an industrial strategy that directs capital to where it's most efficiently needed, to where it can generate the, the maximum productivity gain and export share. And if we redesign, let's call it business banking, around that, rather than the somewhat sclerotic model we have at the moment, in which wider innovation functions play no role at all, what we will have developed for the first time in the UK is an at-scale regional banking system that funds and supports innovation at scale. Now that is not the answer to all of the problem, but that at least would align banking with um, innovation and productivity at scale. That's recommendation one. the need for banks to be involved with stopping crime, to climate change, inequality, increasing asset prices, um, and even thinking about the, the credit function. I really want to bring in the audience, because I've appreciated you've all come and walked up a lot of stairs to get here, um, and I'm sure you've got some <coughs> insights. So I'm going to ask you just to turn to somebody ideally you don't know, and have a conversation about what you've heard. If you want to answer a specific question, it's what should the government's priorities be for the UK banking sector? I'm going to give you two to three minutes, and then we're going to take comments and questions from the floor. So, yeah, thank you. And you can get a drink at the same time.
choosing to manage their money in many different ways and that choice is everything from uh, using your debit or credit card, using contactless, making payments online, um, choosing to make different kinds of online payments and as a result we are seeing far fewer people using branches and traditional branches and ATM networks and as a result it is no longer a, a cost effective to keep those branches open, to keep them fully staffed. Um, actually if you talk to a lot of branch managers um, about uh, working in a, in a branch when footfall reduces and the number of people they no longer see and actually what that does for their own self kind of confidence and, and value in what they're doing actually poses some really important challenges that we as an industry have to address in how we work with our, our colleagues but also we need to find alternative solutions because I think what we can never do is ensure that anyone is left behind by this transition this needs to be what people choose to do so if you choose to continue using cash we need to ensure that you can still have ways to manage that cash but that's a complicated process with kind of many different elements to it. So it's everything from where do you go to get it? Is it an ATM? Is it cash back when you go to your local convenience store? Or is it the post office? We now have over 12,000 post office branches where you can go and access cash. Um, you can check your bank balance. You can pay in money. That's the, you know, that adds an entire extra kind of 50% to the size of the branch network all over again. But also we need to think about how we ensure this is maintained going forward. Because the flow of cash around the UK, through you know, literally the vans driving it around, is currently operating at about 50% capacity. It's not viable to keep that going forward unless we can find uh, a solution to, to make that work in the long term. So one of the things the industry is doing with the support of the Bank of England and with the Treasury is to, to find a way to make a sustainable solution about how we keep the flow of cash effective and build a new infrastructure for cash so that people won't be left without that level of access. And I think it's those kind of initiatives, it's thinking a bit differently about how we use branches, whether they're shared branches or whether you can use convenience stores or different central hubs in your community in different ways that we have to be willing to explore and invest in with the, with the sector. Question? Yeah. Um, 
Great. And maybe picking up on the, this gentleman's question around, you know, if I'm going to kind of nuance what you said slightly, but if the, the, the big banks were told that they had to lend into like certain regional infrastructure projects, I mean, we have we used to have kind of credit guidance in the 70s where there was a kind of a mutual understanding between the Bank of England and the banks that they had to, they couldn't just lend to kind of pre existing assets or financial markets, they had to also lend to, to, uh, to <coughs> more productive sectors. Like how should they respond if they were told they had to lend a, a certain amount? Unlike of potentially some parts of our government, you know, if it is the, the law and the requirement of this country, that is something we will abide by. <laughs> um, but I think for the banking sector, it's really important to remember we talk about lending to SMEs and commercial finance. Um, you know, this, um, it's in our interest as an industry to lend to productive businesses. It's in our interest to lend to viable SMEs that will scale up and grow because SME lending is fundamentally a, a commercial activity and therefore it doesn't make sense for us not to be seeking out that productive growth. And I think the information that is available for the industry is huge. Um, you know, we have postcode level lending data to every, S every SME business lending decision down to your local street, um, which we can analyse and look at, as well as the information that comes in through um, the regional networks that, are, that many institutions and banks have. And I think you know, there is a strong desire in the industry to ensure that we do uh, grow viable businesses, that we do work with organisations like the Scale Up Institute to ensure that there is effective lending right across the UK. And in fact, if you map um, SME lending, again, to productive activity, so whether that's a uh, number of company registrations or the level of corporate activity, actually it maps almost identically. There isn't this sense that we only lend to the southeast and actually if you go up to the northwest, there's nothing there. Actually, um, the level of lending is very commensurate with the level of economic activity, but we do need to keep working with businesses to encourage them to come forward because we haven't yet um, fully addressed the, the lack of trust between SMEs and the sector. And I think there's a real problem there. Can I answer that? Can I respond to that? So if the level of economic activity is the primary motivator, in fact, your answer is no, the regional banking initiatives that Philip recommended aren't going to get the, the funding challenge. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that's a rear view mirror kind of requirement. And, and uh, I think the gap that you're, you know, you're, you're talking about is, is postcode lending data isn't necessarily the right way to judge at scale SME lending. And, and as we were speaking earlier, um, uh, depending which report you read, uh, it's somewhere between you know, 65 five to 75% of bank lending goes to unproductive uh, asset activity. Property. And, and mainly property, but not exclusively. Uh, there, there are other forms of asset. So, what, what we have is, at most, only a third of all bank lending going into productive activity. But that isn't really even my point. And, th and there's a really interesting question. <coughs> what the UK industrial strategy needs to do is knit the parts into a hole that you can lend to, such that you fund the gaps within that hole. So take, for example, um, the UK car industry, let's pretend Brexit wasn't happening. Um, there wasn't a, a engine block hybrid electrical car maker in the whole country. The, the people that made hybrid engine blocks were in Poland, they saw no reason to move here. Now unless you knit together or have a whole sectoral approach, you're never going to create the conditions to fund, uh, to create a fully circular economy <coughs> within, the, within the UK. And even more importantly, if we keep doing everything on the individual business level, we won't convert um, uh, whole areas to being export-led. So all the evidence, I do lots of devolution, I do lots of whole area turnaround. The single most successful indicator is exports. That's what really shapes. And a lot of the companies that are below export level are below export level because they're not linked and they don't even know about the other companies that they are export-led, that they're not linked to, that they could collaborate with. And the missing element, and even our LEPs don't do this, because our LEPs are, are, are a very mixed bag, is we need to knit together the whole supply chain domestically in a place in order to do whole supply chain competition for an area. Now, part of that is reflected in the new industrial strategy with sector deals. So you could 
oddly have a, a sectoral banks, which makes sense, for instance, in the nuclear industry, where you might want to fund modular reactors or, or molten salt, salt reactors rather than water-cooled reactors, where well, we've got potentially, for instance, an enormous nuclear industry moving from Wales to, um, to uh, the northwest, coupled with, coupled with area or place-based banks. But unless somebody does the knitting together, we won't fill the gap that you, that you outline. And postcode data, quite frankly, that's the best proxy we've got for SME lending. You know, no wonder we're in a, a monopolised economy because, because that is not sufficient for purpose. And we lacked at scale both sectoral and place-based data onto who's ahead. And often the companies that are trading ahead don't talk to anyone else around them. This is why even in post-virtual Clusters, clustering still works. Clustering still outperforms as a place-based approach to economic development than anything else. Why? Because you get to look alongside and work with your competitors. And we have no banking or no infrastructure or no economic institution in Britain that knits that together. And we need to develop that and make that the lender. That's my view. Thanks. Would you like to comment on any well, maybe Emma, I'll pick up the thing with the questions on, on cash. Yeah. This is all cash. I mean, cash, it's all virtual. I mean, there's nothing special about the coin in your pocket uh, that differentiates it from most money in circulation, 97 or so percent, which is in fact electronic money right now. Um, I've just come back from the Netherlands. I think that I, in the three and a half years I was living there, I took cash out maybe three or four times the whole time that I was there because you just don't need it at all. In fact, coming back here, yeah. it does feel like step, stepping back a decade. My mum still uses checks uh, and goes to the bank and uh, she says, you know, well, she's safer and I can't argue with her for it. And she doesn't mind paying the more money rather than getting the discounts on direct debits um, mm -hmm. because that's the, what, what she's been used to. And that brings us to another question around how are things paid for um, and we've got suddenly this kind of duality of expecting things to be free banking um, and wanting banks to be profitable, especially the ones which are kind of owned by the shareholder executive now. Um, <coughs> and yet we don't want uh, we don't want any sort of other sort of funny business on the side. So it does tend to be it does tend to be kind of an economic thing which is the barrier for regional banks. There's pro I mean there are regional banks and local banks which are starting right now. The difficulty is. How are they going to compete? And what's the value that we can recognise for those happening? What support do they need to be able to play a meaningful role? Because whilst the large banks are financing SMEs, that's not the full picture, because it's still, if you look at it, so we've got a network of values-based banks like us around the world. <coughs> values-based banks tend to finance about double the rate of real economies of real businesses compared to large banks, because large banks because of sh chasing, historically in the business models, chasing shareholder return meant a lot of um, asset-based finance, which kind of drives more speculation, because the, all, of it, all of our collective will was being translated via pension funds to them as, you need to be able to deliver double-digit returns. Um, and that has distracted the, the, the business of banking away from the, the good, honest kind of banking which is needed and from the innovation that's going to be required um, if we're going to be able to kind of meet the challenges going forward. So there's a, there's a good question about what do we, what, how do we value these things to be able to restack the economics, not just what are the regulatory conditions. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just take off my chair hat for a moment and say Positive Money is also doing some work on central bank digital currency in terms of digital version of cash in order to move the payment system to more of a utility. I won't say too much about it, but just to kind of follow on with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're looking at how you know Visa and Master obviously have a monopoly on the payment system. Yeah. Great. So let's take a, another round. So you had your kind of four and then we'll go to the back and then we'll see if Yeah. Um, my name is John Ernest, I'm a 
have a basic state pension. And the state pension is the worst in Europe, and certainly the worst in Western Europe. And uh, one of the things um, that's important is the availability of cash. I, I deal exclusively um, in cash. I have to go and pick up the um, money from the deposit account in, in the post office, which um, the DWP told me earlier this week that um, the contract with them is coming to an end. So I've got to find a bank account or credit union account, which I won't do either because I don't trust banks. Um, I've had a number of issues with banks over the last 10 years. And um, so um, I'm, I'm in a bit of uh, difficulty um, there, but I'm being bullied by, basically um, by the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, and I think that no one should be made to, you know, um, pull the money out of um, the post office. Um, you can still have a bank, because the post office um, has bank accounts now in the major banks, you can have the money, you know, and pay, your bank account pays you know, through the post office. But I don't trust the banks. <coughs>
Conservative Party has done not been on competition law. And um, consumer welfare is the standard of competition law, which has been true uh, for the last um, two generations, arguably, um, is a pro monopoly, and pro market concentration standard. Um, we have intervened in the tax sector. We, we at Res Publica stimulated the firm in the view. On tech, but it's it's true across the whole economy. Um, so, so I'd agree with your online um, question. Uh, I think we need a, a new rigorous approach from the competition approaches. It's been wholly absent for a good 20 years. Uh, as to the point about political hurdle, we, the size of the UK economy is about 300 billion less than we would have thought if the uh, banking crisis have, hasn't, have not have happened if you extrapolate from 2008. So we're in um, a much smaller economy. Then I don't know anyone who thinks that Brexit won't rapidly depress the, our economic growth, at least for the short term. So we've got to really face up to our productivity problems that are related to our innovation problems that are related to where we put money. And I think that, that the, our present banking system has a very poor record of investing in, uh, in place and uh, on a sectoral basis. And therefore, I think that necessity is the mother of invention and we uh, will create those new lending institutions. Because if we don't, will carry on as before, and that will be ever more diminishing returns, which essentially will reintroduce austerity. And that would be a very bad thing. Well, I think, well, you know, uh, Britain is relatively rich, so it could be a long 20-year decline before it becomes relatively poor. And, and people said that about the financial crisis, said it would bring innovation, and it hasn't. Least of all in the banking sector. So, so one would, could not be optimistic. <coughs> getting closer to communities, getting closer to the needs, being able to provide different services which people uh, require who, who, who are vulnerable or not, uh, are underserved, being able to kind of promote innovation in the sectors in a rapid enough. So until we address those structural factors, we're going to go around in the cycle, we're not going to be able to get the kind of the level of localism, the level of uh, specialism um, that we would require. What we do though, is a system of smaller, more agile banks that are going to be able to invest in the things uh, in, in the future which are closer to what 
uh, the economic priorities and the social and environmental priorities that you've got. Great, thank you. Um, would you like to comment on it? I think just building on the competition point, um, we have to take a different approach to how we build competition in the banking and finance sector going forward. Um, we've, we've seen government initiatives for the, for the last five years um, sort of celebrate the, the kind of 25 plus new banking licenses that have been issued, but simply creating more organisations that are of small scale and size that can't really challenge and grow in this space isn't going to bring genuine competition to the system. We need to look at why we can't build an environment that enables those firms that can to genuinely grow and compete against the incumbents to ensure that they can offer a diversity of choice. But I think we also need to start looking forward about where real competition in the banking sector is going to come from. Because we are changing what it is to do banking, not just in the UK, but it, it's not just um, the deposit and savings accounts vaults, it's increasingly payments activity. And that, that work is increasingly being provided by firms that are not banks, that are not regulated as banks, that are not viewed as banks, but more importantly by customers. Customers don't think of them as banks, therefore, they're not expecting the treatment in particular ways, and we need to ensure that as we have genuine competition coming from this space, we need a, an environment that enables that competition and encourages that competition, but also ensures that customers are protected. Because if you choose to send money with company A rather than company B, you shouldn't have to figure out whether you're protected in the same way. We should have a system that means that you are, but that system shouldn't prevent innovation from happening. I think that's a really difficult challenge that central regulators have coming forward. How do you enable that innovation so that we can have these new, very democratizing initiatives that are obviously being built, but without customers questioning whether they've still got the same rights? Yeah, good point. Thank you. Um, I think we, I don't think there's any more questions, is there, from the audience? Okay, okay great. Let's have two more quick ones. We've got to finish in five minutes. It's about the Bank of England. mentioned one Yeah. I don't see what role the Bank of England Short, snappy answers to finish. Can we start with you and move our way to the um, I think uh, you know, the role of regulators in ensuring we have a banking sector that is safe for all is critical. I think the post crisis reforms that have been implemented um, have created a regime where we have multiple regulators. So the Prudential Regulatory Authority, which is part of the Bank of England, the Financial Conduct Authority, the Payment Services Regulator, the Information Commissioner, um, are all. Um, in addition to the Conflict and Markets Authority, kind of core elements in which are regulating rightly the activity and conduct of our banking institutions. And um, it's key that we keep that under control and review going forward to ensure that it meets the needs of the sector as it grows and evolves and changes. And I think one of the key areas where that work is critical is in payments. Um, we need to ensure that as payments evolve at pace, it, um, we get the regulation right, that the regulations bring about the right protections and that customers understand what those protections are. Um, I think on your final point about how do we ensure better competition, the, um, the point raised in the recent Future of Finance review um, by Hugh Van Stienis, I think, um, allowed for some interesting conversations to have about how the bank could potentially open up access going forward. And I think it would be, if, you know, we're certainly kind of keen to understand how that can, can work and what can be dealt with that. Great. Do you have any comments on those two points? Uh, no, I think, I think um, really interesting point about regulation is regulation favours incumbency and I think that's the dominant reason why we haven't really had any at scale UK banking uh, competition 
And if you look at the capital adequacy requirements now, they're about six times higher than they were during the crisis. And you know, look at the struggles of Metro. It's actually an incredibly difficult market uh, to enter. So, so then we we have to ask, well, what do we do? I mean, arguably, the developments in tech mean that you can provide for consumers' needs outside of the traditional view. And business uh, lending, I think, is done very poorly by the mainstream banks, hence the type of innovation. So that's probably um, how, how I, would, uh, I would tackle it. And more arguably, credit cards independently deal with uh, much of uh, consumer debt needs, and the mortgage market isn't dominated by, by the banks. So, so what would they have left? Okay. Uh, super briefly, Bank of England. Bank of England has actually been one of the leaders in the space in the uh, global front, uh, which kind of maybe says more about the general state of regulation, but they, they have. And they have been part of the network for the financial system. And people like Mark Carney and others have actually started to challenge what is the mandate that they should have as regulators. Because if it is just too narrowly focused on individual banks rather than on the collective piece, that isn't sufficient. And no one is necessarily carrying that mandate. What the, the Financial Conduct Authority have is a sandbox for innovation in the digital payment space. It would be great if they could extend that sandbox to be able to test and experiment things for other things which are more value-based, some of the stuff in terms of localism, being able to invest directly in more impactful funds. Most individuals in this country are not able to invest in anything other than stock market listed funds. What if there was a sandbox to be able to be a little open up more experimentation? And that kind of links to your point in terms of other, uh, other things being opened up. I think, think in terms of uh, Bank of England, reserve accounts, there's probably a, a deeper question. I've just come from um, mainland Europe where the European Central Bank's reserve accounts uh, they're not available to individuals, but if they were at minus 55.55%, I'm not entirely sure they would be flying off the shelves right now. So I think most, most importantly, it's about being able to think about, well, how do we engage individuals in terms of what they're going to be able to do so that people can take different risk positions. People are in different situations. So we can't have a one-size-fits-all kind of approach to what, what is offered, but we do need much more uh, uh, variety uh, and much more opening, genuine opening up to be able to follow the things that matter most. Thanks very much. Great point to end on. I think we've covered a hell of a lot of ground in is the UK banking fit for purpose. I think we all probably say it could do a lot better. Um, covered everything from climate change and equality, banking as a public utility, access to cash, regulation. Um, so just want to thank our panelists and very much thank the audience for coming. Um, I think there's probably a little bit of wine or coffee or food left if you want to hang around for a quick chat. Um, and thanks very much.
might be the great. I think it's the 